Hello and welcome to this video on one of the most important, undirected chemical reactions, hydrolysis. In short, hydrolysis is when water breaks a chemical into two separate parts, and sometimes more again. Uh, this is what gives the name. It is Greek for water and break, hydro being water and lysis to break. Uh, rather than being a uh, narrow specific reaction, hydrolysis can happen anywhere and any time, as long as the right conditions are met. This is the key to both why and how hydrolysis is such an important reaction in chemistry, biology, and more. At the same time, why it is the bane of those same sciences. In very broad terms, hydrolysis is a chemical process in which one water molecule is going to be added to another molecule of something else. This generally is going to cause both the water and the thing you're adding it to to react and split into multiple parts. Generally speaking, you're going to have the target molecule gaining the hydrogen from the water. This obviously requires that the water itself loses that hydrogen ion, leaving it as a hydroxyl group. Because there is a gain in a hydrogen ion, it will break a chemical bond in the parent compound, or molecule. Importantly, this does mean that the hydroxyl group can go off and bind somewhere else and further be used although generally this isn't what's going to happen. Generally speaking, and understand these are very broad patterns, the most common kinds of hydrolysis that occur or that you can easily observe involve either salts or a weak acid, also a weak base, although that's really a counter to the weak acid. For example, if you add a table salt or sodium chloride to water, you'll see that it disassociates, and this can be in part due to the nature of the weak bond, but if you were to add other salts to water instead, you would find that the water reacts to them, and this is how you get the reaction. This is all down to the way that water can effectively, spontaneously ionize. This produces your hydroxide ions and your hydronium cations. The hydroxide is the hydrogen oxygen, and the hydronium is just the hydrogen ions. The salt itself will disassociate to then match with their anion or cation partner. Sodium acetate is an example of this. You get the sodium and the acetate separating out. The sodium reacts somewhat with hydroxide, whereas the acetate reacts much more with the hydronium. This will produce acetic acid for you and, to a certain extent, a water. This leads to an excess of hydroxide ions, creating a basic solution. Where you have weak acids and bases, or salts, you have strong acids. Now, strong acids will undergo hydrolysis, largely owing to the fact that they will accept a hydrogen ion. And because water is made up of two hydrogens and an oxygen, they are able to undergo hydrolysis to create the hydronium bisulfate, for instance, if you were to add sulfuric acid to water. Unsurprisingly, this is not exactly an ideal situation and it's one reason why you try not to add a water to an acid or a base. Rather, you add the acid or base to water. On the other side of this, we do have acid-based catalyzed hydrolysis. And this one is a slightly more complex, largely owing to the fact that we are talking about the role of acids and bases in facilitating hydrolysis, not just the role of water itself. There are several well-known examples of this occurring. This can generally be described in broad terms as having a nucleophile, that is a nucleus-seeking molecule, whether it is a water or the hydroxyl ions being generated, finding a carbon or carbonyl group of something like an ester or amide. These, being in an aqueous solution, attract that nucleophile, and because there's the free hydrogen position, and they jump in and grab it, and this leads to protonation. The consequences of this are that the hydrolysis creates a compound with a carboxylic group, which is an acid. The general process has also been used to produce more alkali or basic products. For example, ester hydrolysis of zapontins, soap fundamentally. This is when you get fat, which is a triglyceride, and somewhat basic by itself, and you combine it with the aqueous solution, along with sodium hydroxide. In the process, you get glycerol, which is a basic molecule, and some salts, 
the salts are what we would consider soap. A more, let's say, a day-to-day -day use form is with uh, saccharides. Generally speaking, we can talk about its role in both disaccharides and monosaccharides. Uh, less often to do with polysaccharides for slightly different reasons. Uh, when we have uh, monosaccharides, that's a, a single molecule of, say, sucrose, it has a, a nice neat little carbon in there that can be broken down, but it's generally protected by bonding it to other particular molecules of either the same or a similar saccharide. This leads to a disaccharide, like for example maltose, where you have two glucoses stuck together. Hydrolysis can break this connection, leading you with two distinct and separated glucose molecules. In more day-to-day -day functionality, we actually have a bizarre relationship between hydrolysis and, for example, mRNA vaccines. The nucleotides that make up RNA, and for that matter DNA, will undergo hydrolysis, and in fact this is necessary. This is down to the purine bases in the DNA or RNA strand. Because of what they are, they will undergo hydrolytic depurination, and this fundamentally starts to break down the nucleotides and lead you from having a strand of DNA or RNA to having basically what can be recycled. That is, you can take the nucleotides and plug them back in to either make more RNA or more DNA. In terms of vaccines that rely on mRNA, this is why they don't last very long in the human body. A part of it is purely down to the fact that, despite adding a relatively large amount of RNA, it gets broken down over time, and at the end of about a week, there is no more messenger RNA to be had from the vaccine, although there is some variability in the exact time frame. The final examples we have for you, and arguably final common kind of hydrolysis, involve metal ions. Now, metal ions can undergo hydrolysis either to break down a more complex metal product, or, in some cases, for more basic metal products. For example, when you get rusting, Rusting is just oxidation, but part of that process requires you break off the necessary parts of the metal to then produce the available material to oxidize. In other cases, you can actually look at using the whole hydrolysis reaction to produce particularly desirable products. For example, if you want hydrogen gas, Hydrogen gas can be driven out of water, largely by breaking down a large amount of the water itself into hydroxyl groups and hydrogen gas, meaning it's available to use. In terms of day-to-day uh, -day functionality, it's not really going to find that much use, but in terms of chemistry, acetyl, amines, and amines can all be both hydrolyzed and reverted back into ketone forms Using hydrolysis, this is generally mediated using an acid as a catalyst. And this brings us to the final form of hydrolysis, acid hydrolysis. Acids can be used to facilitate that hydrolysis reaction. For example, if you want to take cellulose and convert it into something else. I'm largely thinking here if you want to try and convert it into starch or glucose. The hydrolysis reaction allows for the acyl group substitution, which means you can get a carboxylic acid and you can make it from a relatively readily available ester, and as long as you're reacting it in an acidic environment, create what you're after with carboxylic acids. Of course, it's not just used for that. Nitriles into amides are also another way to do this, and you can also use it to take a cellulose or cellulose-like material and break it down further. The last example is effectively the opposite side to acidic hydrolysis, and that is alkaline hydrolysis, unsurprisingly. This again relies on nucleophilic substitutions rather than the acid allowing you to substitute, which ultimately the processes are fundamentally similar, albeit somewhat different. They generally involve taking an ester and, for example, a turning it into a carboxylic salt and an alcohol. Hydrolysis is why anhydrous chemicals exist. These are the chemicals where the presence of any water is bad or unwanted. One reason for that 
is hydrolysis. If you have a chemical compound that will break down with the slightest presence of water due to hydrolysis, you want to drive out all of the water for very obvious reasons. But then again, you may want to use hydrolysis. For example, breaking down something like starches or more likely uh, disaccharides into something like glucose or monosaccharides that can be used in, for example, brewing. Thank you for watching this video. If you have found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please do post any comments, questions, or suggestions you have below.